Hello, friends, and welcome to the season two finale of Miss Shelved. This is where I would like blow a kazoo triumphantly if it wouldn't ruin your audio experience. I'm your host, Nicole Brinkley. If this is your first episode, welcome. Every other week, I introduce you to an independent bookseller in conversation with an author they love. There's so many good episodes to listen to in seasons one and two, so make sure to go back and try some of those too. I'm so stupid excited for you all to listen to today's episode. I love them all, but this one is particularly special to me, and the conversation is fantastic. But first, thank you all for listening, for sharing, and for supporting the podcast. We've been doing this for a year. Enough of you support us on Patreon that I could hire a technical editor. The support has been incredible and unexpected. Genuinely, thank you. We will be back for Season 3 on January 31st. You'll see some bonus content and a few weeks off as us booksellers recover from the holiday season. But until then, you can listen to today's episode on repeat, because it's that damn good. Our bookseller for today is Allie Kirkpatrick. Hi, I'm Allie Kirkpatrick, and I'm the owner of Old Town Books in Alexandria, Virginia. Allie is in conversation today with one of my all-time favorite authors and the host of her own incredible podcast, Sarah McLean. Hi, I'm Sarah McLean, and I read romance novels, and I write them. Listen in as these two talk about everything romance and independent bookstores. Like, everything. It's the best. I'm so excited to talk to you, and I promise it's not going to all be about minotaurs. We're going to talk about other stuff. (laughs) Oh my god, that minotaur book. Well, let's talk about minotaurs, too. I know. I just just wanted to start strong and, like, lean into that, because it's, you know, I mean, that's... Jump right into the deep end of the pool. If you know nothing about romance, we begin... There, yeah. just in the deep end <laughs> with the minotaurs. No, not to um, scare anyone away, but I was thinking today. I'm not sure we've ever met each other. We no. have worked together a lot, but we have, thanks to the pandemic, never met each other. Yes, and I guess maybe I could share the origin story. I found your work when I opened the bookstore. I was not a romance reader, but we started a club, and our club leader said, "Here's your intro guide to romance," and she gave me a stack of your books. Mm-hmm. And I think I read them in like 48 hours. Yay! You know, like, you know, <laughs> and then I just was like, immediately, I was a convert, you know, I just immediately, where has this been all my life? I was raised, uh, you know, Southern Baptist and sex was bad. And, you know, so I just, it was never on my radar. And I was like, oh my God. Mm-hmm. And then I just went down this wormhole and listened to your podcast. And during the pandemic, I heard you say, oh, I just wish there was something romance writers could do to help indies. And I was like, Bring, bring, hello. (laughs) (laughs) And so you did. You called me right early. I mean, talk about somebody who just was on it. It was really early in the pandemic. I think it was in April of 2020. Mm -hmm. And you said, will you teach a class for us? And I was so happy to because all I want to do all the time is talk about romance novels. And it was a really popular, I think we had 500 people from all over the world sign up for it. And you know, just looking through notes for this chat, I have their list of questions and they're so craft focused. And I, and I think that's really interesting that like so many romance readers are also writers. Mm-hmm. The beginnings of the modern romance genre, the 70s and 80s, where a lot of us mark the beginnings of modern romance or romance as we think about it today. Uh, many, many of those early writers and big, big writers, you know, Sandra Brown and Jude Devereaux and Joanna Lindsay, you know, writers who, if you've been around in romance for any length of time, you've at least seen them go past, go by your eye holes. (laughs) Um, And most of them started just as readers Mm -hmm. who, or not just as readers, but started as readers. And I think most writers start as readers, but we have a really rich community of reader writers Mm -hmm. in our world so were you one of those like did you think of yourself as a writer first or as a reader of romance first oh no I'm a romance reader first (laughs) romance reader always I definitely have moments where I think oh I could hang up my pen (laughs) Uh (laughs) and go back to a real nine to five but never. I can't ever imagine not reading romance. I mean, I started reading romance when I was 11 or 12. Okay. This is a really common origin story for so many of us. I had an older sister. Many of us have mothers or grandmothers. It's usually a woman in your life who read 
romances voraciously before you. And then one day you open a drawer or look in a closet or open a box, or in my case, look under your sister's bed. And there are just hundreds of them in there. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, you know, there it is. It's like um, the suitcase in Pulp Fiction where just, you know, suddenly there's just gold light <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> and, um, and so for me, my sister went off to college and she left all her books under her bed. And once I found them, I mean, there was history and there was swashbuckling and there was adventure and there was kissing and it was perfect. You know, I listened to your podcast. I listened to Faded Mates a lot. And I think I remember you talking too about going to a women's college and having like a shared romance bookshelf in your dorm. Yeah. I yeah. was so jealous when I heard that. I was like, I went to Barnard. We did not have a romance shelf. Well, I mean, you should have come to Smith. I don't know what no. to say. <laughs> Wrong, wrong we were so close. You were so close, Allie. You were so close. Yeah, I was um, a late, a late blooming romance reader. <laughs> I went to Smith, which is you know Hallmark, Gloria Steinem's alma mater, and romance has really, romance gets a real bad rap, Allie, as you may have noticed, yes. and it gets a really bad rap when it comes to feminism. And mm -hmm. often, this is this is one of those big questions that gets bandied about when we talk about the genre, how could it possibly be feminist? You know, especially when the roots of it are so cis, so het, so white. And I think that often we get shunted aside because we're about love and the happily ever after is often considered to be somewhat reductive mm -hmm. and it's somehow less meaningful when women are able to triumph or marginalized people are able to triumph on page and not live in trauma. But I think because of all those things, I think happiness has a ton of power when you are mm -hmm. a community of people who have not always been shown in happiness. You know, there's a gaze in romance that is not a common gaze in the rest of media. I had instinctively felt that way, I think, when I was in high school. There's a reason why I applied to Smith. I, I didn't tumble into Smith and discover um, progressive politics or feminism or, you know, inclusivity. Um, but when I was a voracious romance reader in middle and high school, I instinctively understood this, I feel like. But then I got to Smith mm -hmm. and I was in Lamont House, for those of you out there who are Smith grads, and Lamont House at the time had a romance novel collection that was passed down year to year. You know, when a senior graduated, she would pass it down. And it was its own, it came with a, an, its own bookshelf and the books were filled with marginalia that were cognitively dissonant maybe for a lot of people who don't think a lot about the genre or understand the genre or who a little side eye the genre where it was you know real feminist conversation in the margins you know conversations about subverting patriarchy and you know doing important work in the world and i was bequeathed this collection and it was mine for 3 years and it was really great I think mm -hmm. so much about those books and I wonder what happened to them because I think romance has this very cool history of having a kind of reader conversation in the text in libraries too. Library collections often have these markings, these kind of hieroglyphic markings in the backs mm -hmm. of the paperbacks, largely because the covers often look the same. And certainly in the 80s, Fabio was on a lot of them, the 80s and 90s, with his gravity-defying hair. And so you couldn't necessarily tell all the books apart from the cover. So people would mark the backs inside the back covers of the books to mark to tell themselves what they read. Mm -hmm. And they'd also, in my public library, they would put exclamation points on the ones that they really liked. It was like Goodreads beta. Uh huh. I love that. So we've talked about a couple of things, sort of like the like baby romance reader. I want to come back to that and like yeah. starting in romance and like jumping in with minotaurs or jumping in with historical. And I want to come back to that for sure. Yeah. And then also one thing that's really cool that you mentioned, who is romance for and does that turn people off or not? And like, is it really just not a very diverse genre, things like that? I remember in your invisibility interview, the host was like, yeah, I thought the clinch was weird because it was really hetero or whatever. And then she kind of comes around to saying like, no, I think I was judging my mom for being a romance writer. Like I remember 
Um, oh, wasn't that amazing? Yeah, that was amazing. This, there was an episode of 99% Invisible, which is a fantastic podcast about design. And the producer of this episode's mother, Pamela Mingle, is a romance novelist. Katie Mingle is the name of the producer. And Katie decided that she was going to do an episode of 99% Invisible on romance novel covers. You can go listen to it now. I was interviewed for it. But yeah, over the course of it, Katie kind of comes to realize that she's been judging the books. And mm -hmm. well, I have a question for you on that end, because mm -hmm. you came to romance late. It sounds like we had a really similar journey, you know, through life <laughs> mm -hmm. from school to women's college to, you know, publishing in, in some way to books in some way. But now you're an independent bookseller. And one of the things that over the last few years, independent booksellers have started to get more and more and more on board with romance, but mm -hmm. that wasn't always the case. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit, like what was the barrier to it for you? Yeah, I guess when I was a, a baby romance reader or not even like just, I was completely romance ignorant. So I think I, I probably must have encountered the books in my early reading life somehow, but I never saw them in my house. You know, no one in my family read them. None of my friends read them. And now I look back and I think that's just so sad. I didn't even see them in the library. So I don't know if it's because I'm in Virginia and this like uptight, weird place. I don't know. I, you know, I, I remember seeing them in passing at like the pharmacy or something, but I didn't really have any connection to them at all. Like I didn't even, I didn't judge them because I just didn't even see them. Like, you know, I went through college, I was an English major and I never, you know, the first, maybe the first romance novel I read was Jane Eyre, if you can consider it that. It's yeah. kind of a, an HEA. Yeah, it's definitely a, I mean, it's a, a primordial text. So I read that at summer camp in like seventh grade and I stayed uh -huh. up all night reading. I was just obsessed with it. And I wanted, wow. I like craved it. You know, it's <laughs> One like, of it's, us. It's like, Rochester's it's the worst. It's just like, <laughs> It's just, uh, you know, it's like the grumpy one and the, you know. Um, oh, sure. Whatever. Grumpy sunshine. And I just wanted it so bad I ate it up. And then I read some other Bronte stuff and I was like, oh, no, this is not, <laughs> this is not happy. Heathcliff doesn't quite, doesn't no. quite land the same way. It's a little too tragic, but I ended up studying Victorian literature as a major. Um, oh, so but you were sort of destined to find us at some, I, at some point. And now I opened the bookstore in 2018. It was a pop-up. I had you know, seven books in the store. I had no romance section at all just because I didn't know. It. I, I also didn't have like a good sci-fi or mystery section. I just only had like lit fic and like a couple of kids books because my daughter was 18 months old and I was so ignorant. And most booksellers you'll talk to, they read everything. And I've had to grow into that. Like I do read across genres now, like a hundred percent before I did not. So my store when I opened was like seven books and it was a pop-up. And these two women walked in, Kristen Coates and Danielle Baller. They're amazing romance readers. Mm -hmm. And they said, you need to have romance. And I was like, okay, you tell me what to pick and I'll, and I'll have it. So I gave them like two shelves of romance and they made it really great. Oh, I love this story. This is how indies should be doing it everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I was really ignorant, but then like, I just met these two great ambassadors for the genre, yeah. but I didn't read it. And then the store had been open for six months and it was doing really well, but I think most people who are entrepreneurs or small business owners know it's it's really hard. And, and in book selling, it's really hard too, because every single person who comes in is like, I hope you do well, but like, you're probably going to fail. You know, like, it's like this constant, like, you're going to sure. fail, but like, good job trying, kiddo, you know? Um, and I just- you know, What a cute out dream my, you have. Cashed out my 401k and, you know, put all my eggs in this basket. So I ended up, the first vacation I took after working like, you know, 60 hour weeks was- a family trip and I stumbled into an indie bookstore and I just grabbed this Highlander romance off the shelf mm -hmm. and it was like a little too I didn't get too into it and then that's when Kristen was like oh no dear sit down and let me <laughs> do this and it, he it like healed me like romance healed me I was so burnt out I wasn't reading anything and like t to this day I still use romance as a lot of people do which is a refresher okay I read this book I don't know what to read I'm gonna read some romance then I'll yeah. go back to this and it's like a, a well, palate cleanser it's a palate cleanser. It's also a comfort. It's a yeah. sense. Of, I mean, hmm, I have a lot. I have a lot of things to say. Yeah. <laughs> no, m my husband knows what space I'm in emotionally by what's on my nightstand. And if it's like sure. five romances, he's like, are you okay? And I was like, I'll be fine <laughs> when I finish these five romances. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I mean, I think that that is the joy of romance. I think romance leads from a place of joy, from a place of happiness and that is can be 
unsettling for new readers. Mm -hmm. They they don't know how to um, process a book that is really designed for you to just delight in it Mm -hmm. for a few hours. And when I say delight in it, that doesn't mean that there aren't you know, very low lows in romance novels. I love a low low, as you mm-hmm. probably have <laughs> have noticed, Allie. Yes. Um, but the the promise of the premise of the romance novel, the covenant that we have with our readers as writers, is that we are going to carry you through emotional highs, emotional mm-hmm. lows. We're going to take big swings. You're going to be on a roller coaster, but at the end, everything's going to be okay. Yeah, and I yeah. think that now more than ever, right, on month 20 of a pandemic, it feels like we're doing a job here. We're not just silly women, you know, scribbling down our feelings. I or think silly, silly people scribbling down our feelings. I, I go back and forth. And do I want to, like, defend myself to this, like, man who's telling me I'm going to fail as a business? Yeah. Or do I want to try to like convert this like snooty historical lit fic person to try a romance? And some days, some days I can do it. And some days I'm just like, you're you're lost. (laughs) But I I will say what I have told people and I believe is really true about romance is like, it will help you. It will like get you through stuff. It's about pleasure and fun, but it's also, like you said, about a, a spectrum of emotions. It's not just this one note thing. And to me, it's really fascinating that, you know, good literature shows you something about how people are. It shows you how humans behave. It, it makes you realize something. And romance is the exact same way. Like, romance will show you something and how you react to it. And it's surprising. Like, I, I did the read along for Sherry Thomas a couple months yeah. ago, Faded Mates. <gasps> oh, that book, Ravishing the Heiress. I was like crying. I was so sad. And it was just so cathartic. And it was. It was a really sad book, you know, because this woman is like shutting herself down and, you know, the guy she loves is, you know, she's off his radar, but, but it's really a slow burn. And I was so surprised that I responded that powerfully to a romance because usually I read it for candy, like, yum, 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 you know, just eat it up. And and this was, Mm -hmm. I was really, I was like, what is this about? Is this like some baggage I have about being a noted? You know, it was really, it made me think and, you know, that's something you, you have to kind of experience to know that I think about the genre it is all fun and and light but it also isn't right I mean I think it's also a really we've said this on the podcast a a number of times but I think it's a genre that's very domestic and what I mean by that is it really does deal with the internal life that we all live you know there are big plots god knows i love a big plot i'm currently writing essentially an adventure series mm-hmm. but The real meat of the romance novel is about our emotions, the way that we interact with other people, the way we build community, the way that we love, the way that we hurt. And these kinds of emotions are very private. And there are not a huge number of genres that do this as a matter of course, where this Mm -hmm. emotional work is bedrock to the genre. In fact, I'm not sure there is another genre where this mm-hmm. emotional stuff is bedrock to it. But there's no such thing as a romance that doesn't explore the real depths of human emotion. And, and I find that when I see something that's classified as lit fic or something, and it does do that, I'm like, wait, this has a happy ending. This what The new Sally Rooney is a romance. Like, yes. You know, like, it happens. <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> yeah. I'm responding to this strongly. Oh, it's a romance. That's why. <laughs> I mean, that's, I think, one of the, um, you know, we're all looking at Emily Henry's magnificent books, right? And we're saying, you know, Beach Read, when it hit so hard last year, you know, I think that I have a lot of opinions about Beach Read as a package. Like, I think it has a gorgeous cover. I think it has the perfect title. Um, But ultimately, that book is a romance novel. And Mm -hmm. that's why it resonated so well with so many people because it did the work for us over here in our pool where there are millions of us, literally millions of us reading literally hundreds of thousands of books every year. And then there are all these other people who came at Beach Read for, you know, a quote Beach Read, Mm -hmm. but found themselves tumbling into the romance pool. I guess maybe that's a good place to ask you about your thoughts on, um, you know, so the romance genre having these like categories of historical, contemporary, 
From a book selling point of view, we canceled Beach Read. We had it in our romance section and we had it in displays and we sold it as a romance, but it wasn't like a mass market size. So it was sort of yeah. under the radar. It's interesting because, you know, this is all on the publishing side, but at, when it first came out last year, it was not presented to the world as a romance novel. Right. And I think that's a really interesting choice. And I think that there's something going on right now in romance and and book selling and publishing and marketing where we are starting to see something new. I've said this before. I feel like we're seeing a star being born mm-hmm. right now. And I think what's happening is there is a section of what we you know, would traditionally refer to as a romance novel that is being pulled out of romance. And it's overlapping with you know what we would ordinarily call a romance novel, but it's somehow appealing to a wider audience. And that is largely contemporary. And these are the books that we're all seeing, that you're seeing in your stores that are in trade format and with illustrated covers, many of them. And they have these bright love stories that end happily, but mm-hmm. they are a different kind of text in some ways. And I don't know, that's not always the case. Some of it is just packaging, right? It's same serial, different box. And some of them are doing something a little different. There's like a modern, a truly modern romance, the romance of the 2020s mm-hmm. that is being born right now. And I think one of the interesting things about romance, and this is true of every genre, there are these waves, these kind of generational shifts in romance, just like there are generational shifts in other genres. But romance moves so quickly. Mm-hmm. Those shifts move so quickly because for a couple of reasons. One, we write faster, largely, mm-hmm. than our siblings on the other side. I write slow and I write a book a year, but there are many of us who are writing three or four books a year. Mm-hmm. Um, and some people in independent publishing who are writing six, seven, eight books a year, um, which is bananas to me. So the books are coming more quickly. And because they're coming more quickly, they're reflecting society more quickly. Mm -hmm. So if I were writing a piece of literary fiction today that was going to be published by Knopf, for example, then I would write it and it would take two years for it to come out. That's just not how traditional romance publishing works. I mean, my books are turned in six to eight months ahead of time before they end up on a shelf. And so the books reflect literally what's going on in the world. So it starts to feel like our generations move more quickly here in romance. And you can mark them with themes and and subgenres and even, you know, types of heroes. But there's something right now we're in the midst of a star being born. There's a shift mm-hmm. happening. And I don't know what it's going to look like in two or three years, but it's going to look different. I don't know what it's going to look like, but it's going to have an illustrated cover. <laughs> <laughs> At some point, I think, you know, there was a time, I don't know if you remember this, but there was in the early aughts, that was the rise of Chiclet. It was like the late Uh 90s, early aughts. Thanks to Bridget Jones, Helen Fielding just blew the doors off and then everybody was publishing Chiclet. And those had illustrated covers too, many of them. In romance, when something starts to sell, all the publishers, you know, they just like pick it up and run with it, right? So I think there was just a glut. Yeah. And everything is cyclical. And so when you've been around, I've been writing for 12 years, but when I talk to people who've been writing for 20 or 30 years in the genre, they'll say like, oh, well, you know, historicals are always going to sell. You know, like there's mm-hmm. just, there's always an audience for a historical. There's always an audience for a cowboy romance. There's always an, ordi- an audience for, you know, those Harlequin category romances. But it ebbs and flows. And in, you know, the mid to late 2000s, there was this rise of paranormal romance that just blew the doors off. I mean, you just, it felt like there was so much money being poured into paranormal. And then paranormal waned. And then the billionaires came and Mm -hmm. then the billionaires waned. I mean, people still love a billionaire, but I think they're waning now. It's so cool that romance is the seed for those cultural shifts. Like I can think of all those TV shows that were paranormal. I feel like the primary resources are these romance writers and then it's the show for it. And then it's the movie for this. Right. Well, I mean, there's a lot of discussion, right, about, oh, Twilight made vampires happen. And romance have been doing vampires for Mm -hmm. about five years by then. 
I mean, I th- I do think historically romance has always been a little bit of a canary in the coal mine in the sense that when we, um, you know, we were the first genre to really embrace ebooks, we were the first genre to really like blow the doors off independent publishing. We were the first genre to switch to a mass market format for not pulp or for not reprints, Mm -hmm. um, original mass market. So I think as goes romance, so goes publishing is one Mm -hmm. of those adages that you hear now and then. And it seems to be very, very, it's an interesting conversation because I think that people forget that romance exists, period. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, or want to pretend that it doesn't exist. And then there's no question that our readers are voracious. They read, on average, 10 to 12 books a month, mm-hmm. as you probably have seen. And often, I think about Christine Onorati, who owns word bookstores in Greenpoint in Brooklyn near me. I remember her saying to me a few years ago, you know what's fascinating about romance readers is they don't buy books instead of other books. They buy them mm-hmm. in addition to other books. Oh, yeah. That's totally true for us as well. Our, you know, in retail, when I opened the store, uh, another retailer who owns like a, a popular shop in the city said, you know, find your people and take care of them because you'll do like you know, 80% of your business from 20% of your customers. Yeah. And my romance readers are the ones pre-ordering everything, cookbooks, literary fiction, hardcover, nonfiction, like everything. Um, So I think that's definitely true. And I think most people, the general public is definitely ignorant about romance, but, you know, I read that it's the only billion dollar industry in modern publishing. So it's not under the radar in that respect. Like the people behind the curtain know Mm-hmm. what works and mm-hmm. i guess like maybe the trend of of like do you think romance is becoming more mainstream or more accepted or just more understood or is it still sort of muddled i think some kinds of romance are i think uh contemporary romance is really having a real renaissance right now like i said i think it's really shifting and changing and more and more people are coming to it i think i heard somebody at um berkeley talk it was maybe like the last book thing i went to before the pandemic started and cindy huang from berkeley said that part of the shift into trade trim size and these illustrated covers was to appeal to an aging YA market, Mm -hmm. you know, where are those readers going? And I think that that's a really interesting thing because I talk all the time about how when I was young, I mean, we had YA novels, we had a handful of them, but it didn't look at all like the magnificent vista of Mm -hmm. YA now. And so I think there's something to be said for YA is building these wide communities of readers and Mm -hmm. then they are aging and they they need their characters to age with them. So I think that's interesting. But I do think that um, historical is still like deeply misunderstood. And there was a time when it didn't matter that historical was deeply understood because there were so many people reading historical. And it is the backbone of romance in terms of history. The modern romance genre exists because historical romance was blowing the doors off in the 70s and then in the 80s and then in the 90s. And that's not to say the contemporaries didn't exist. You know, Harlequin and Mills and Boone were publishing category romances constantly, but historicals were a different beast. They were bigger. They had meatier plots, not because the categories didn't have them, but because they didn't have the page count for them. But historicals were four or 500 page long tomes, (laughs) sagas, and really dramatic. I mean, big, big adventure novels about pirates and knights and, you know, swashbuckling highwaymen dukes <laughs> and princes from foreign lands. I mean, this is where they they really did feel like fairy tale adventures in those early days, except they had sex on the page and they were mm-hmm. about grown-ups having grown-up thoughts and grown-up feelings. Mm-hmm. As the genre expanded, historicals expanded and grew and aged and diversified and became more inclusive, although we have a long, long way to go still uh, across the whole genre, but especially in historical. And now I think we are up against a misunderstanding often. I think a lot of people feel like historicals are going to feel boring or like work. I think they feel like historicals aren't going to have 
modern sensibilities. I think they feel like they might be old fashioned in the thinking of them, in the writing of them. It's hard to like think about, you know, one singular type of romance reader because you'll say like, oh yeah, there's these books that are kind of refreshing historicals and it's in this context, but it's got modern theme. There's consent, there's all these things. And then you have like the people who want the old school historical romance were like, I don't, they would never say that or they would never do, you know, there is yeah. this, really this range of books that people want. And I'm primarily a historical romance reader, 100%. And so when I go through an author, I just will like churn through their backlist and then yeah. find yeah. who I like and then get surprised by a new writer that I discover. Like, when I found Diana Quincy from your best of list last year, I was like, finally, a heroine who's like not 12. And, you know, she felt mature and older. Um, well, that book, that's um, Her Night with the Duke. And mm -hmm. we should have said this before, but Old Town Books last year put together a book box of The Faded Mates, which is my podcast, Best Books of the Year episode. So you could listen to the episode and then order the books from Old Town in advance of the holidays, which was great. We were so grateful to you for doing oh that. Oh my gosh, we were so happy to do it. But I think like, you know, you can't please everyone. And I know romance readers can be really tricky to kind of it's cater really, to them all. Yeah, but it's also frustrating because first of all, I'm just going to say it. It's also kind of insulting as someone oh, yeah, who, sure. who writes historicals and who often gets the, oh, they would never behave that way or they would never look that way or that community would never look that way or those people wouldn't be allowed to be happy or my favorite, they would never use that bad word mm -hmm. <laughs> that I can't say on this podcast. But the truth is, one, I do my research. I am friends with many, if not all, of the top historical romance novelists out there. Mm -hmm. And not one of us phones in our research. Mm -hmm. And I think about Joanna Shoup's magnificent Gilded Age romances set in mm -hmm. New York City during the Gilded Age. Her Uptown Girls books are, I mean, I want them to get film deals. I want everyone to read them. I am obsessed with these books. And Joanna's level of research on the Gilded Age is just impeccable. Mm -hmm. But because she's writing characters who, you know, women who choose their own destiny, right, who have agency and move forward in the world with agency, it's a question of, well, that would never have happened in the 1880s. Right. Um, but that's just not true. I mean, we didn't all get brain transplants between, you know, 1920 and now. Mm -hmm. Women have, and history proves, bears out that women and marginalized people lived happy, fulfilled, exciting, adventurous, magnificent lives throughout history. Mm -hmm. And just because we weren't taught that in school doesn't mean it didn't happen. And frankly, we should be mad at our history teachers <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because there are some amazing stories about magnificent, powerful actors in the world. Mm -hmm. And I mean, in historical, we write very extra people doing very extra things. And that's where I think the joy comes in for us. They do feel like adventure novels. You know, when I sold um, my series, Hell's Bells, which I'm writing now, the first book is Bombshell, um, and you can get it from Old Town Books. When I sold this series to my publisher, I said, I want to write Adv The Avengers, but I want to make it Victorian. And I want to put power and agency in the hands of women. I love how you talk about sort of the oral histories of the origin of romance and like wanting to document the historical importance of it. Oh, I was going to talk about this. I was going to yeah. talk about this. You're so, you're ahead of me. Great. Yeah. So so Rebecca Romney, who owns with Brian Cassidy, Type Punch Matrix in Washington, D.C., you know, Rebecca was the Pawn Stars book expert, but I met her at the Smithsonian at a Rare Book Talk, and she and her friend Heather started a prize for young women book collectors. And so that's how I met them, because I'm also interested in the rare book trade. And I also noticed in like archives and co collections, there's not a huge attention from a institutional perspective of keeping track of the romance genre and sort of documenting it. And so yeah. this just blew my mind when I saw that Rebecca had done yeah. this. Um, and it's a, it's beautiful. So this, this project, it resulted in a catalog. So Rebecca did a collection. She went out and she collected an enormous number of 
early editions, first editions, romance novels, whatever she could find that were, you know, important texts of the genre. And she found a home for it. But the catalog is called The Romance Novel in English. And you can find it online at their website, Type Punch Matrix. But this work is, I mean, I bought, I, I, pre-ordered a copy of the catalog mm -hmm. it arrived at I my house a copy and, too. I, and I opened it up and I got teary because mm -hmm. this is my biggest sadness my great sadness is that no one has collected the stories the books the history of the romance novel the modern romance novel and and I should say Rebecca's project goes all the way back to the 1700s but because of my own reading passion and because of what I write I'm really concerned about the fact that the modern romance, which was happening, you know, and what I mean by that is sex on page, orgasmic, mm -hmm. you know, pleasurable sex on page, um, is fairly new. We're looking mm -hmm. at 50 years. It's 50 years or so, 50 years from The Flame and the Flower, which was published in 1972. So next year is the 50th anniversary of that book. And we have many of these voices still with us. But we have started to lose them, and no one is collecting them. You know, the books are pulped. I mean, one of the things, one of the great, you know, sadnesses to me is that because of the format of romance novels, they're meant to be fleeting. And so if if you are looking for, say, Rosalind Wells's first romance novel for Candlelight Ecstasy, which she wrote as Elsie Washington. It was the first own voices Black contemporary in modern romance. And it's virtually impossible to find, not because people are hoarding them, but because they were all pulped. So this is true of so many books in history, but the primordial texts of the genre, of our genre, are gone because they were never meant to stay. Mm -hmm. And the voices, the primordial voices of our genre have not been collected because patriarchy sucks. And thinking about, too, the mainstream availability of romance plots and, and cultural products like films and things like that is that the film production pipeline, there aren't women romance readers in decision-making positions and things like that, but that's starting to change, you know, like having Shonda Rhimes adept yes. the Bridgertons and stuff yes. like that. So as that's changing, it's, it's getting better. And I think it's really interesting in the rare book trade that Heather and Rebecca are spearheading this initiative at the Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America. And I was one of the awardees of it this last year, where they're taking young women book collectors or people who want to get into the book trade and they're pairing them up with a senior book collector so oh. it's all of these women who are gonna, going to be able to inform institutional collecting and, I love and it. collections for individuals and you know that's a new thing and, and this program it's called the women's initiative at the ABAA it's making a huge difference already and just seeing you know Rebecca's work on romance novels I'm assuming she was also inspired by one of the award winners of her a Young Woman Book Collector Prize had a collection of jazz age romances and it won the prize a few years ago. And I was just like blown away. So I was like, oh, I never thought that you could have a collection of a certain periods of books. Yeah. And you're right. It's like, those books are meant to be read, meant to be handled. They were in your pocket. They were past the friends and they just fall apart. Yeah. The mass market paperback was designed, I mean, it was designed for pulp fiction, right? The format size, the trim size is designed to fit in a back pocket. Um, and then as they got older, they stayed that size because they fit perfectly in a woman's purse. So she could coupon clip, save her $3 and 99 cents, the grocery store and throw in her weekly book. And it was the size of her purse. And I mean, you could tell that when you pick up these old books, like there's nothing about these books that's designed to be preserved for years. I mean, I right. remember I, I've, I have emailed with Rebecca about I'm looking for a very specific romance novel, a first edition of a very specific romance novel. And I mean, it's basically impossible to find. So uh -huh. those of us who are interested in this this world and, and romance in general, the history of romance in general, we're just haunting tag sales, uh -huh. hoping that someone's grandma you know, has this book. I mean, I will say, I, I just should have named it earlier, but Bowling Green State University 
in Ohio has the Brown Pop Culture Library. And oh, cool. they the Brown Pop Culture Library has a magnificent collection of category romances, which they're in print for literally, you know, a handful of months and then right. they go out of print and oh, get them then. I know that all too well from book club. We well, try to bundle it. This is a good time for us to talk about something else, which I think is so important this year, especially, and that is supply chain right now, Yeah, which I know is impacting indies maybe more than it's impacting everyone else. Do you want to talk about that a little, Allie, and explain what's yeah. going on and maybe tell everybody to order their books early? Yeah. So I guess the supply chain issues that are hitting books right now are, you know, a supply of paper to actually print books. There's a couple of gigantic online retailers that will remain unnamed that use a lot of paper products. And so there is actually a shortage of paper for printing books. There's also a lot of closed fulfillment centers. So distribution of books is tricky that, you know, COVID's closed a lot down or reduced staff. So we're finding that, you know, October, November is when we're trying to get people to think about holiday shopping. Retail bookstores, rely on the last two months of the year. I think we do, you know, a quarter of our sales in the last 60 days or something. It's just right. really this huge, it's a huge time for us. And then the problem is though, is if folks want a certain book, we kind of have to know now. And they're, they're starting to say like, it's going to be instead of one or two days for a special order coming in from our warehouse in Tennessee, it's like five days, seven days, 10 days, two weeks. So we're encouraging people to shop early, but also to be flexible and be like, we've got a lot of great books in the store. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah, I know you might need, you might need this certain one for your, your family member, your friend, but also just talk to the booksellers. It's what we do best. We love to hand sell. We love to mm -hmm. problem solve. Like, yeah, maybe you did want that certain book in the series, but like, what about this other one that we have in stock that would also be a fit? So we're just kind of trying to communicate that to people. And we all have COVID fatigue. We're all just tired of this and, and kind of ground down. But just trying to remind folks that for retail and restaurants, we're still in it. We're still in the pinch. We're still understaffed. We're still so stressed out. And and it's we, we tried to go back to in-person events for our book clubs and we had to cancel them. And we had a lot of grumbling about consistency and customer service. And it, it's just like, come on, we're still in a global pandemic. Yeah. Be kind to your booksellers, everyone. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, remember too, that your indie booksellers are your neighbors. They, right. they live in your community. They want it to thrive too. I want to say we are recording this at the end of September and you are hearing it in November. So do what you can to support your yeah. local indies, head in there and be kind. Gift cards are great. And I, I want to just underscore that there is, in romance specifically, and I know a lot of the people listening to are probably romance fans, our backlist is a real struggle for a lot of us right now. A number of my backlist titles are very difficult to get right now because of supply chain stuff. So mm -hmm. just be aware of that. And I can tell you that everybody along the line is having conversations constantly about how we can fix this. And it's going to take a little while. First, get vaccinated. And then... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess the other thing I would say is in terms of just bookstores in general and romance readers, I have experienced firsthand that indie bookstores can be hit or miss with how welcome they are to romance readers or, or how they get it. And I think they reap what they sow. If, if they're not a romance-friendly indie, um, I would never send a romance-loving friend into a store that I knew kind of poo-pooed it. But I think they're all kind of getting on board with it and seeing it and learning about it and hiring booksellers that are romance readers. Um, you know, our store is not just like romance-friendly. We're romance-obsessed. Mm -hmm. I, I totally get that, especially with Romance 2 and e-readers, people want to do that format. Um we do audiobooks. A lot of indie bookstores do audiobooks. A lot of indie bookstores do ebooks for Kobo. Mm -hmm. um, so I totally get it. I also, there's some stuff that you can only get online or, you know, serialized yes. stuff. Although, can, I mean, that Minotaur book was only online and now you can get it in print too. So. Yeah. Yeah. So if you vote for it, you just, just gotta wait. Um, but yeah, that's how I try to think of it for people is like, you know, voting for indie bookstores, like we have a yeah. value, we sell a product, but we also try to sell an experience and like a value for our community because 
a lot of people that come in my store have never read romance and they leave they leave reading romance so it's we are sort of like the boots on the ground like the proselytizers for the general public and yeah. i think when, if you're able to vote for independent retailers by spending some of your romance dollars there it just it does so much good for the community of of romance readers and the local area too yeah i mean i will say i'm going to tack on to that some stuff <laughs> cuz i have been evangelizing romance for independent bookstores for 10 years, you know, a decade. And I think there are a couple of things here. One is you reap what you sow, like you said, you know, community comes. Once you start buying romance novels from your local indie, I promise you, your local indie is going mm -hmm. to support you with events. There are so many romance book groups that are happening mm -hmm in indie bookstores around the yeah. country. Those did not exist a decade ago. I will say as far as from the bookseller's side, I think it's really fascinating because for a long time, romance was a, a dirty word among mm -hmm. a lot of booksellers um, when I first started, but it's not that way anymore. I think people are saying the word like, oh, we carry romance, romance thrives here. And what I would say is that if you are interested in romance, if you don't know anything about romance, and a lot of people don't because even if they know a little bit about romance, like, oh, we sold a lot of Emily Henry books or we're you know moving a lot of these TikTok books, right? I think what's interesting is there is certainly an awareness in publishing in general that it is a huge, immense pool. And where do you even begin? I mean, there are literally thousands of books published every month in romance. And so I think what Allie did by yeah. listening to Kristen and Danielle and giving them ownership of a shelf or two to help mm -hmm. prime the pump, so to speak, in romance is so valuable. I did that for Word when I first met Word in Greenpoint. They did not carry romance. And I said, let me help you. And they gave me one shelf in their tiny footprint of a store. Um, and now they, I think they're moving romance pretty briskly. So yeah. we've I like, have a dream hey. of having like a whole wall of romance, not just two shelves. Oh, um, that's amazing. I, I wanted to ask you just one more thing if you have time. Sure. Um the Hell's Bells series was inspired by your research about this lady gang in London. Yes. I just love that so much. And I tried to find something for you. I emailed Honey and Wax and we found this like program from a silent film called the queen of the 40 thieves so i guess the 40 thieves was also the 40 elephants and they yes called themselves the elephants because they would shove stuff under their skirts and like yeah leave. thank god for bustles <laughs> here's a book for you to put on your shelf next to bombshell as a package deal brian mcdonald's alice diamond and the 40 elephants is nonfiction, and it is a total delight to read because these ladies had no chill. <laughs> they were wild. And I mean, this is why when we get to it's not historically accurate, it makes me rage because I had to pull back. They had custom made cages built underneath their skirts in the 1890s and then pockets, thanks it has pockets, sewn into their dresses so that they could walk in the front door of Selfridges, say, or Harrods, and then just literally swipe whatever they could get their hands on and shove them into these deep big pockets and they would be collected in the cages underneath their skirts and then you know within minutes fill their skirt cages and then walk out the side door and offload everything into the skirt cages of a number of other women who would take off down the street and by the time you know the police or security from the business met them on the outside they they everything was gone. Um, I mean, they were remarkable. PSA, please don't go shoplift. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, include lo you include lots of tips on how to do it. But don't exactly. Do it. But it was very cool. And, you know, one of the coolest stories from that whole thing is not a thing that I can put, you know, or I mean, I don't know, maybe it'll end up in a book, but a different version of it. But the 40 Elephants was the largest shoplifting ring ever in, in UK history. And it was all women. And it lasted from the 1870s 
to uh, the 1960s, and the final queen was buried in the 1960s, or buried in a dress she stole from Harrods, a $5,000 dress she stole from Harrods. Wow. Um, so, you know, they just, these women were larger than life, and they existed. We know mm-hmm. they existed. So, um, thank you so much for thank you. having me, Allie. Thank you to Old Town for being so romance f- friendly, romance obsessed. I can't stress enough to indie booksellers out there how grateful and aware romance is of those of you who support us because it's mm-hmm. not as common as it should be. And mm-hmm. um, so I just, I really, I just want to honor you, Allie. We're, you we're glad amazing to be your, work. your street team. We're here. You're hype people. We're ready. <laughs> Thank you. So this is a good place for us to talk a little bit about where people can find us. So right. tell everyone how they can find you and Old Town. So our website is oldtownbooks.com. And on our events page, you'll see our book clubs. And we have different genre book clubs, but we have Bad Romance Book Club that meets every month with Kristen and Danielle. And we meet online and we read a different book every month. And you know, the price of admission is that you buy the book from us and we ship it anywhere so oldtownbooks.com, um, and we're on Instagram at oldtownbooks.com. And yeah, those are the main areas for us. And you can find me, Sarah McLean, at sarahmcclain.net. That's where you can find all my books. And uh, you can find me on Twitter at Sarah McLean and on Instagram at Sarah McLean. And I have a podcast with Jen Prokop, my friend, and we talk every Wednesday about romance novels, we either do a deep dive or we talk about tropes. We unpack what scratches the itch and why. And this season, we are talking a lot about the history of the genre with conversations with the people who built the house, so to speak. It goes back to what we were talking about when we were talking about Rebecca Romney. We are collecting voices of the people who trailblazed romance from as far back as we can get. I don't think I've said the name of the podcast, though, which is it is called Faded Mates, and you can find it wherever you listen to podcasts or at fadedmates.net. And if you are interested in ordering the Faded Mates Best of the Year book pack, you can get it from Allie and Old Town. Uh, so we'll have a link for pre-orders on our website, and it's a nice giftable box full of all of the books from the year that Sarah and Jen choose. So you can pre-order that now on oldtownbooks.com. Thanks for having me, Allie and Nicole. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> we did it. Our season and a whole year of misshelved comes to an end. A big thank you to our authors, our booksellers, and especially you, our listeners. Double thanks to our Patreon listeners who help support us so we can keep this podcast going. You can join them at patreon.com slash N-E Brinkley. That's me. You can also keep up with us over on social media at Miss Shelved Pod. We'll be back on January 31st, 2022. Until then, happy reading. <laughs>